Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Nikki Jovakik from Look Up Strata. We're very excited to be hosting our first COVID-19 webinar and I'm very happy to welcome our panelists today. Joining us is Wal Dobro from COVID-19 Plans and BIV Reports. This session is a little different to other webinars we've hosted. Usually we hold state-based sessions referring specifically to one state's legislation. Today we have people joining us from New South Wales, Victoria, ACT and South Australia, plus possibly other states. Please note, when Wall does refer to legislation, he will mention which state this includes. We remind you that strata legislation does differ state to state, so please keep that in mind during the session. Feel free to share this recording with neighbours, committee members, other staff members, or anyone you think will be interested in the session. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in this session including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. Further, due to rapidly changing public health orders, we will do our best to provide the most up-to-date information available at the time of this session, which is the 1st of September, 2021, noting we are not medical professionals and are unable to offer health, health advice. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today. Wal Dobro from BIV Reports, COVID-19 Plans and Reserve Fund Plans. Wal Dobro is a valuer with over, over 35 years experience specialising in strata and compulsory acquisition matters. He has detailed construction experience and engineering qualifications. He's also an accredited practitioner, fire safety, has all four asbestos qualifications and a Cert 4 in training and assessment, plus a Cert 4 in WHS. Wall has been a member of the Strata Industry Working Group for over 15 years, providing advice to New South Wales State Government on strata issues through the LPI, now known as the Lands Registry Services, and previously the Lands Titles Office. Wall wrote the Common Property Memorandum that provides clarity and solves the majority of issues in strata schemes dealing with the repair, maintenance and renewal of a service or an area in a strata scheme, the majority of which has now become legislation. The strata consultancy businesses are utilised by over 60% of all individual strata managers. Wall, I'll pass the session over to you now to share your screen and tell us more about the importance of having a COVID-19 safety action plan. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, I want to take everyone on a little bit of a journey. And part of that journey is, it'll be covering a, a few topics from common law duty of care, which is codified in our civil liability acts and work health and safety legislation, which is in some schemes, not uh, greatly relevant and then what I call the third bucket is the right thing to do. We're probably all feeling a little bit burnt, burnt out with uh, lockdown and limitations and those that, that take an active interest in your particular schemes. You've probably done what I've done and read through the health websites. There's 50 odd pages there trying to understand what it is they're really trying to say. And as well as the information is uh, as well-meaning as the information that we have to read. It's a matter of trying to interpret and see exactly what I have to do in my particular scheme seems to be the key question. The politicians are good at what they do. The health department officials and uh, public servants are good at what they're doing. And ultimately, when I look at the, the grassroots area, I'm finding a lot of owners and strata managers saying, okay, I've read all this stuff. What is it that I'm supposed to do? So we seem to be missing what the how and the why is. We get told um, we're all in it together. Um, we should all be assisting each other. Just do the right thing. Okay, what is the right thing? And it's the how and the why that has led me to put together the COVID-19 safety action plan. And the action is the important part because as you know, the purpose of education is not so much the gathering of information, but putting things into place, doing the action. You might have all the, all the knowledge in place, but unless you put that sanitizer out the front or delivery drop-off point out the front and try and keep bubbles safe, then we, we miss the point. There are a couple of terms that I'm using today and I'd like you to take away those. And one of those is safety bubbles. And those safety bubbles can relate socially or your work bubbles. And what I mean by that is 
in the small environment that we interact with, what we try and do is keep those bubbles safe. For example, I was speaking with one of my clients and one of her staff members is locked away for two weeks. And the reason for that is someone in her residential tower let the pizza guy in, went up through the lift, dropped something off on the sixth floor, found out to be uh, COVID positive, the entire scheme is now in lockdown. Had they utilised some of the measures that we're suggesting in our plan, and that is having an external delivery drop-off point, that bubble would have been reasonably well protected. And that is delivery drop-off point. It might be as simple as having a, one of those cheap plastic tables you get from Bunnings and put a few bricks on, having a QR code on there, a sanitizer, and that's what you, where your exchange operates from. And looking again on the grassroots, so I'm probably going to take you for a little bit of a different journey on, on left and right. Um, I did a little bit of research on their CDC and the question I was researching was how long does COVID-19 or really the SARS virus, I'll speak briefly on that, and COVID-19 is typically the all-encompassing term people use for the virus and the disease. So when we speak about COVID-19, we're talking about the disease, but it's the virus that causes that disease. So I just want to make that clear when I'm talking COVID-19, the technical people, that's, oh, it's really the virus, not the disease. So as a, a normal um, everyday person re refers to COVID-19, but how long would that last on surfaces? CDC, um, porous surfaces could be anywhere from minutes to hours, non-porous surfaces, days to weeks. Typical indoor environment, 99% reduction can be expected within three days. So New South Wales Health says may persist on services for a few hours up to several days. WHO, World Health Organization, 72 hours on plastic and stainless steel, up to four hours on copper, up to 24 hours on cardboard. So think about that when you pick up your pizza um, uh, delivery, and that's, that's the importance of having sanitization at that particular transfer point. Wikipedia has got some information as well. Temperature has an effect as well. I might just throw that up. That's just one of the interesting bits there. That'll be in one of the handouts if you need to see later. But again, it talks about the short period of time that the virus can stay on surfaces. So why is that important for us in a strata scheme? It's important for us because for larger schemes or shared facilities areas, and that includes driveways, rubbish bins, some people think that because I've got a, a 10 villas, we don't have swing pools and other these large facilities. Well, in some areas you do. If you've got your rubbish bin area, or you've got people coming into the property for deliveries and the like, you have that interchange and you have opportunity there to break your safe bubble. And those are the areas that we're looking to protect. So that's primarily why strata is important. The other reason strata is important is City Futures last year did some research and for New South Wales, 15% of, of the population live in strata. 22% of all households are in strata. So if we can get the message out correctly and properly to, um, to um, the strata industry and our strata properties, then that'll be a significant benefit for all of us in our community. Okay, some of the key issues that I see um, and talking with strata managers and owners is that there's too much general information. There's no strata specific information from the government to assist in actions and people have to wade through too many pages. And long time waiting, if you've tried to get through to health and you've been on the phone, you sit there for ages. I had one the other day on the health website, rang, sat there for a long time, finally get hold of someone. I want to talk to someone about uh, contingency plans. So I'm putting something together for the industry. Oh good, I'll shot you across to fair trading uh, in the strata section. Uh, no, I need to talk to someone specifically in health and someone fairly senior, can't get through. And the other missing point, and that's the benefit of where I'm gonna to lead to is the action points that we have in our particular plans. If I look at what state governments have done around Australia, the best I've seen so far is Victorian government. They made it mandatory for owners of corporations early this year to have a COVID safety plan, they call it COVID safe plans, in place. And, and that document wasn't too bad, but it, it did miss 
having a contingency plan and a notification plan and risk assessments. They refer to those things, but if you look at your mums and dads out there and even the professional people, strata managers and the like, and you say, can you prepare a risk assessment for this particular scheme or lease for strata? The stretch is, is quite a long stretch to achieve that appropriate risk assessments, as well as contingency plans and notification plans. We have those in our plans. Um, I think the other aspect, when I look at what we have with COVID-19 historically, in the earlier stages, and I think there's broadly three stages, we're all trying to work out what effect this will have on our community, on us individually, what, what we should be doing. Is it going to expand? It's going to go away. The second stage is primarily putting measures in place from social distancing to lockdowns to a whole variety of other measures. The third stage is pretty much where we are with those measures in place, but more particularly we have quick reaction. And that's why it's important to have QR codes and people logging in and out so that if there is a positive hit, then the close contacts can be contacted by the, uh, by the uh, government and then appropriate measures of, um, of uh, self-isolation and quarantine would be put into place. One of the things I've come up with is, and looking at everything around Australia is for strata specific properties, what is it that um, I need to simplify in terms of principles for strata? And we've come up with six principles and they're in two broad groups. They're preventative and they're reactive. And the four principles that I see relating to um, the preventative side are social bubbles, and that's where we minimise any cross uh, interaction between groups of people. The second one's physical distancing, and that's applying density quotients to areas. And you've seen those things in lifts where it says uh, two, um, uh, two people per lift or six people in this particular location, displaying signage and posters, uh, education, training, and, um, and further posters, uh, following the plan and providing the latest information. Fourth one is cleaning, hygiene, and face masks. And um, from that, um, you've always got to carry those, uh, clean and disinfect an area. So it's cleaning the surface and then later coming and disinfecting and providing sanitizers. They are the four principles that I see from a preventative basis. The reactive elements, that's once you get a positive hit. Now there are two of those areas. One is response planning. And response planning deals with contingency plans. And those are the things you do when you have either a positive hit or when your scheme goes into lockdown. The um, other side or the other um, element of that um, planning side is notification plans. Who do you notify and how do you notify those people? Surely it's health, it's um, safe work in, in uh, New South Wales, and work safe in other states. There's uh, the residents, um, there's putting signage up in the front of the property. Those points of consideration are, again, in the plan and help people with a fairly uh, structured and step-by-step -step basis. The sixth principle we have is contact tracing. And as I mentioned before, New South Wales government or state government uh, QR codes uh, are worthwhile to have. Now, QR codes are pretty robust um, animals. Um, you only need about 45% of the QR code to pick up and to take you somewhere. Um, QR codes can be presented for anything. Uh, you can have it either a document somewhere, um, URLs or web, web page and the like. Later on, you'll see it's going to become more important in Strata. We have a Strata portal. The first version was released uh, a week or so ago. Um, and ultimately, when you buy into Strata and to get the DNA of that building, you will look at it and get a QR code and that will take you to those types of documents. What I might do is I do have a QR code sitting behind and for my sense of humour, I'll, I'll put this up and see how many people get a hit with their putting their phone up, put on photo mode, as you know, and see if you could pick this up. It's not intended to be something so easy that I'll put it in, in front. And as people have a go at that, see the section somewhere, I can put that on a bit of an angle. And it still should, again, still pick up. Yeah, we've got some comments coming. 
works. We have got some comments saying, yeah, that it does work, which is great. So thanks for that. Well, yeah, it's good to have an interactive session. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, but, well, I wonder whether you can pick up the one behind me. If you, I've, I've got my three oldest boys, um, Kel and I help them set up with this, uh, the COVID-19 planning side of things. And I said, well, let's look at the QR codes. And they came back and said, oh, the QR codes are, you know, pretty good. Oh, <laughs> I can see a question came up. Where do you get your QR code for your building? It's early days at this stage. Um, just off to the side there, um, last week we had a um, meeting for software people. There were only four in that group, including myself, uh, with the office of the building commissioner and the, um, the digital people in the state government who've been doing a phenomenal job. Um, and that is something a little bit further down the track. There's, there's a number of st stages going, but ultimately you're about to get a QR code for your building and look at the, the DAs, the workers executed plans, the warranties, the certifications. Uh, and in my view, depending on what the government wants to do, you might even pull out some of the title documentation that you have on your contracts. So that's a little bit of a diversion. I said, I'm gonna take you for different journeys. <laughs> Um, but about 18 months ago, I gave uh, across a working copy of the Strata portal, and I just put the things that I, that I wanted there to be in. Then there was titles, there was DAs, so it's now tying into the, um, the planning portal in New South Wales. So you can follow those documents. The work is executed, the DA approved plans, um, the uh, certifications, and I mentioned before warranties and any other documents. Um, and then on top of that, there was contacts. So you have your primary, secondary, tertiary and other contacts, but you could have multiple of the primary contact, whether it's a strata manager, the chairperson, if you wanted, it might be the fire guy, it might be you know, the building manager or facilities manager, and that makes life a bit easier for government and ourselves to you know, contact the right people earlier. Um, that's, that's a future, that's slightly off topic, but it's, uh, it is worthwhile. Okay, I've gone for a little bit of a journey on that. I did say with, with the boys that came up with a QR code, and I said, okay, how robust is that? You've, you've got a nice QR code there, but that's not good enough. Let me have a look at it on an angle and put it right out as it still work. And they are very robust. Now, just while I'm on QR codes, and I'll probably solder back onto it, the benefit of the QR codes is not so much that you've got it stuck on the front part of your building or, or down near the letterboxes or some other area. What, what the boys come up and said, well, it's pretty easy. You take a photo of the QR code, you do a screenshot, you send it to yourself in your SMS because rarely do you send things to you. So it's fairly much forefront of your, um, your uh, access point. So I send myself a message. I've got uh, a tradie turning up to my unit to do things rather than say to him, can you go down to the end of the driveway, left hand side, past the tree, there's a little box there and next to there, there's a green something rather, and there's a QR code Can you scan in. Yeah, who's gonna do that? So you're best off just saying to say, there's my phone, would you mind scanning in? And obviously keeping your social distancing as well. So I see that as being practical, particularly if you have you know, friends come by. And that again is how our society has changed, our environment's changed. We're gonna get in those habits of doing those things. I'll give you a scan into my building, into my location. Here's the QR code. And that's, that's a very practical tip on, on getting that through. Um, and we've just got a comment there quickly. I'll just um, jump in. Uh, well, please. quickly, David saying from Victoria. In Victoria, you can go to Business Victoria and you can get uh, you can generate a QR code for your um, OC building down that way. So yeah, and I yes. think most of what you were talking about uh, just previously was to do with New South Wales as well. If if that's correct, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And in Victoria, you can generate QR codes very easy. You can put your address in there. You can put your um, in a way your business and they give you quite a few lines that give you your second line so you can put in whatever you like and drop that in in victoria we we utilize that system for the qr codes so we do have uh, COVID 19 plans and phone number prepared for the property and it's that property specific and that's their qr code and that's the last um, pages because they give you multiple pages different size qr codes and that's the last pages on the COVID 19 safety action plans and 100 correct so there are other websites you can go to to create QR codes for free, uh, but primarily if you're doing QR codes for your building for strata and COVID, please use the government ones. And that's meets our you know, third stage of uh, rapid response um, through our contact uh, traces. I want to talk briefly about duty of care. We all hear about that, our common law duty of care. That's primarily codified in the Civil Liability Acts throughout Australia. In Victoria, we have the Wrongs Act, Section 42, and in New South Wales and other states, it's Section 5B. And 
what it means is that um, what it means is there's, there's a couple of principles that you need to consider. And those principles primarily dealing with was the risk foreseeable? And it's the risk that you knew or ought to have known. So it's no good saying, oh, we won't get a report, but we know that things may be a little bit dodgy, but we'll, we'll go quiet about it. You can't hide away. It's what you knew or ought to have known. It makes it fairly clear in the legislation. It's, the second point is, was the risk not insignificant? And as we know, with COVID, people die or get physical complications for a long period of time. Um, so that gets that tick in a way. And then the third one is what the reasonable person in that person's position put in place. And I'm buoyed by that area when I prepared the plans. And as I mentioned before, I, I deal in risk on a, on a regular basis. Every day I read every major case on negligence throughout Australia, have done for the last 15 years. So in a way, I'm, I'm the expert in that particular area. And when I've crafted these plans, I've made it easy for people to follow, but also to give a degree of protection under the civil liability uh, legislation in each of the states. Um, just looking at some of my notes uh, through here. That there is a borrowing uh, term, that's the person in the management control of a workplace, a work health, place, a work health and safety legislation. But I think it comes across a little bit in relation to the civil liability aspect. And that is, if you've got influence over your particular scheme or your committee, um, either in the control, that is the physical elements you can put in place and, and more direct, as opposed to management of that area and management's more to dealing with uh, licensing and, and insurances and those sorts of things. What I do tell strata managers is that you are in the management of a workplace because you can ask for competency and licenses and insurances and safe work method statements. You don't have to understand the safe work method statements. You just need to see that they've actually got them. When I talk about insurances, this is a very important point. In the risk management module that the strata managers New South Wales would have done last year as part of their licensing and the document that I had written, I made it fairly clear that it's no good just saying with a, dealing with a contractor that turns around and says, oh, we've got, we've got professional indemnity insurance and stop there. You actually have to go one extra step further in your due diligence. And that is to say, well, where does it say in your professional indemnity insurance that you can provide and you're covering us for asbestos advice or COVID advice? Very hard to get asbestos, very hard to get COVID, very, very hard to get external combustible cleaning clearance certificates and coverage on insurance for that. So it's no good just saying, oh, that particular contractor has professional indemnity insurance. You've got to give that one extra step. Um, so where does it leave you in relation to risks? We all know that hazards and the intended risks uh, sitting there, people are familiar with slip trip uh, hazards. Um, obviously a, a, an example would be for a hazard of uneven stairs, but the risk is that someone will trip and fall. Um, exposed wires, which occasionally get on those small uh, telecommunication boxes in older schemes or maybe a broken light on common property. Uh, the hazard is that broken or open area. The risk is someone could be electrocuted or, or be injured. That's the hazard, that's the risk. COVID-19 is not any different. It's still a hazard. It's still, and then the risk is that someone could be injured and as a result, suffer loss or, or damage in a way. The difficulty would be trying to prove it. As you're probably aware, someone might say, I've got that from your scheme. All right, what, you haven't been out shopping at any time or filled petrol up with your car or been anywhere else or didn't get any deliveries. Why is it our fault from an owner's corporation point of view? So it doesn't stop anyone from suing. Anyone can sue, but why do you want to get dragged into that, um, uh, into an argument or a fight for, for no reason if you put appropriate measures in place? The um, other important part on that is, it's not so much, let's have an argument about whether we're civil liability uh, laws apply or work health and safety laws apply or some other excuse we might better come up with or, or miss it and, and, and adjust or do whatever we can come up with. The critical bit is you put these measures in place to protect your family, your fellow residents and other peoples around you. So it's not so much a let, let's get clever about which bucket it should be in. Is it a civil liability bucket? Is it, is it in the 
uh, work health and safety bucket or is it just the right thing to do bucket? It's primarily in the right thing to do bucket. And people, in a way, uh, forget that. And that's primarily we put these measures in place. You know, I say to some people, you know, how would you feel if you didn't put these measures in place and your mum fell ill or one of your kids fell ill or you fell ill? And we see examples on the news where people, uh, families in, um, in hospital and, and um, having issues in that regard, what measures do they put in place? I'm going to talk briefly about work health and safety. And there's, there's a couple of very important areas in that. There's section 20, subsection two. Um, I'll just read that because <laughs> I, I like this uh, uh, particular part. It says, the person with the management control of the workplace must ensure, so far as reasonably practical, that the workplace, the means of, and of entering and exiting the workplace must be without risks to the health and safety of any person. So again, I talk about people in control. It's a tradesperson, put, bar put barriers up or, or um, uh, put signs and measures in place or don't put the ladder in a dangerous spot and then people in management. It doesn't give a distinction. It just says the person in management or control. So it doesn't say and, it's an or. So you get captured as a strata manager, you get captured as a committee member, anyone responsible, anyone can exert uh, control or influence, and that's it. <clears throat> there is another provision in the Work Health and Safety Act that people are not that familiar with, but it's, it's 19.3F, and I'll read that provision. It says, and this deals with primary duty of care. And that's a person conducting a business and undertaking must ensure the health and safety of other persons are not put at risk and the provision of information, training, instruction, or supervision that is necessary to protect all persons from risks to their health and safety arising from work carried out as part of the conduct of that business or undertaking. Now, a strata scheme under the model of work health and safety provisions can argue that we're exempt if we meet certain criteria. And yes, you are. Under clause seven of the regulations, there's a body corporate and in New South Wales legislation, it talks about the Strata Scheme Management Act um, and being an owner's corporation, uh, being the body corporate, but it says a body corporate is exempt from being or is not deemed to be a person conducting a business or undertaking, therefore exempt from the act. If it does not engage a worker as, a, as an employee, it can engage a worker as a contractor, subcontractor and the like, but once it engages, a worker as an employee, that is, you give money to someone as a as a um, as a uh, employee and have, in a way, the control over them. Then you are in the work health and safety legislation side. The other part of the exemption is lost when it is no longer only for residential purposes. So, if a commercial flavour or retail or other, no longer residential purposes only, then that exemption applies. So. Where does that leave us when people are working from home, which are in our workplaces? And if you do the legislation and do some research in uh, Safe Work and WorkSafe and you know, the National Safe Work Australia, they are workplaces. And you as an employer who have people at home, you have an obligation there to ensure that their, their environment that they're working from is, is safe things like ergonomic chairs, sufficient lighting, good ventilation and the like. And a lot of us have checklists so that if we do have our employees that working from home, we'll go through and here's a checklist. Can you please have a look at it? Um, going back prior to, um, uh, to COVID, um, I'd go over, have a, have a talk to employee that want to work from home, with children and other things, and make sure that that place is set up and it was safe and I was satisfied in that regard. So if people are working from home, and that's their workplace, does that lift us living in strata to a higher level of responsibility? It probably does, but it gives you a point of consideration in that regard. The other part I like of this, this legislation is, there's primarily persons conducting a business or undertaking, and there's duties and responsibilities and obligations dealing with those category of people. There's workers, there's about 12 definitions of, of workers. That includes volunteers, uh, students uh, carrying work experience, contractors, subcontractors, employees, employees of contractors, employees of subcontractors, and the like. And the third category that I, I'll talk about is other persons. And what is important about that is other persons have a duty under the Work Health and Safety Act. So if you are in the Work Health and Safety bucket, then other persons have a duty. And that is primarily, and I'll, I'll read this part out because again, I like this part, it's 29 of the Act. 
a person at a workplace, whether or not the person has another duty under this part, must take reasonable care for his or her own health and safety and take reasonable care that his or her acts or omissions do not adversely affect the health and safety of other persons. And that they must comply so far as the person is reasonably able. And that's the term, it says reasonably able. In work health and safety legislation, we have a term reasonably practical and it's defined section 18. And it's basically a time, cost and trouble exercise. But for other persons, it says reasonably able to comply with any reasonable instruction that is given by the PCBU, person conducting business or undertaking, to allow compliance with this act. And why do I like that? It's if that part of that strata scheme is deemed to be a workplace and you put instructions up and other persons fail to adhere to those, it's not only your, your bylaws that you can, if you have those in place, you can work with, but it's also penalties that come to, to be. There's three categories in work health and safety legislation. Briefly, the highest category, it says engages in conduct that exposes the risk of death or serious injury or illness without reasonable excuse, with gross negligence, or is reckless as to the risk. Individual is $381,000, rounded figures, and five years jail. Body corporates, 3.8 million. Category two, failure to, that exposes a risk of death or serious injury or illness. Individual is $190,000 fine. Body corporate, 1.9, no jail time in that regard. Yes. Sorry, while well, we've just been asked, is that referring to Vic, New South Wales or national legislation that you're reading out at the moment? We're just being uh, asked by Cameron. No, that's a good question, Cameron. Thanks for that. Um, nearly all states other than Victoria have adopted the model work health and safety provisions. So when I refer to section 19 in uh, work health and safety legislation, which is the um, model, it's throughout Australia. Um, Western Australia will be uh, putting that in place later this year when the regulations uh, are completed. Uh, late last year, I think 26 October, their upper house um, resolved to adopt the, the um, uh, model provisions for work health and safety. In Victoria, it's the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, from recollection section 19 down there provides assistance in that regard. So the principles are reasonably the same. Um, we've gone away from the old employer employee arrangement, that's the old style of OHS, to the more modern of a person conducting a business or undertaking to workers and then to other persons. So if you like, send that across and I can give you the particular reference for that. But that's, that was a good question, Cameron, thank you. The category two, as I mentioned before, it just failure to expose a risk of death or serious injury or illness. And there's no other um, basis listed where before gross negligence or um, reckless, et cetera, and 1.9 million body corporate and 190 as an individual. The last category is fails to comply, comply with that duty, no other basis listed, 63,000 or fine and 630 odd thousand dollars for a body corporate. Um, common sense on common property. What I, what I might add in here, maybe I should have done this at the beginning of my talk, Strata Community Association New South Wales have done a terrific job assisting our industry in dealing with COVID-19. We've got great leaders who have provided assistance, not only to state government and state government leadership through uh, people like Matt Press, who's the director of the Office of the Building Commissioner, um, Chris Duggan, uh, Tony Irvine, and um, Stephen Brell have all assisted, and obviously our general manager there, Sid, uh, and Lucy from Education, have all put together some pretty good packages for uh, the community to have a look at, and in a way, filling the gap from what the government policy is above to what the health people are trying to put together, us trying to understand it, to the more practical tools. And there's some new tools coming out shortly for that. One particular point is common sense on common property. And what does that mean for the individual? There's a whole stack of things. Don't touch buttons with your bare fingers because what will people then do next? Oh, well, I'll then scratch my nose. Well, isn't it that, you know, create that transmission point? Yes, you know, you use the back of your, your finger or whatever, but in our, um, in our plan, we've got our own posters that say, you know, don't, don't touch the, this button, use an inanimate object, a pen, a key, uh, a stick, your, your um, um, any, anything else you might have, their corner of a credit card. You know, I do that when I swipe my credit card and they say, can you type in the pin? Sure, I use the corner of my credit card. I tap the numbers with the corner of my credit card. Why do I want to start pressing buttons? As I said before, our whole world's changed, our whole, 
manner of operating around here has changed. We go away from hugging, kissing, and touching things that other people have touched. I've spoken about how long the virus stays on surfaces, and we just need to be mindful of that. I'll talk through the common sense, common property fairly quickly. Avoid touching your face. Use the delivery drop-off point. And that's, in my view, one of the most important things you can put in place in your scheme. That's the external delivery drop-off point. Again, sanitizers, QR codes, somewhere where you can have a safe interchange from that, that side. Keep up to date with the health orders. Wow, if I go back about three weeks ago, I think I spent four hours reading that particular health order and then referred to others. And, you know, I'm pretty good on the legislation analysis. How's mum and dad and everyone else trying to understand this? I would say the last, last two or three um, health orders have been a lot easier to follow. They've broken areas up. So oh, the general area is all the state. Stay-at-home areas and areas of concern. Okay, and certain requirements you know, in each of those. And I'm still getting asked people to say, if I go in or out of an area of concern, do I have to get this new travel permit? Yes. But what if I go from a safe area, sorry, stay-at-home area to another stay-at-home area, as in local government areas? Do I need to get one? No. And they do have a very good um, uh, link so you can actually put the address you're at to the address you want to go to and it'll tell us whether you should get a, a travel pass or not. Screenshot that, keep that as your record. And that's the like. Those people that are working and moving around, you need to follow those directions. It's not a matter of being ignorant because when the police pull you over and say, where do you live? Give me a look at your license. You're in an area of concern. Where is your permit to travel? And you've got to have one. And it's pretty easy. You just pop it up on the phone or what you've printed. They will scan it and see that you have a permit to travel. When you do fill that documentation in, it's a $22,000 fine and two years jail if you provide a false declaration. Going back to common sense, common property, Maintain safe social bubbles. Um, wear a face mask in New South Wales. It's mandatory in all common areas on strata and community and company title properties to wear a face mask. Use sanitizers. Avoid face-to-face -face interactions. You see in some of these areas you have reception, you've got that perspex barrier. Limited use of communal areas. Um, if for some reason you did have to use a communal area, then our plan puts considerations in place. Think about rostering. Okay, Nikki's team can look after it in, uh, albeit that location from seven to nine. And then there's a gap there for an hour or so. And then, you know, team B can go there for, you know, an hour a bit later, sort of thing. Now, individual owner's responsibility. Everyone has a duty of care, as we know. And that's the actions of our emissions do not reasonably, do not cause unreasonably, come back one, <laughs> that a person's acts or omissions uh, do not cause reasonably foreseeable harm to any person or damage to property or cause someone else to harm another person or damage property. However, there must be obviously some positive reliance on uh, that person who's not just acting reasonably. You must suffer harm to, to uh, sue for negligence. And there's a whole swag of compensation you can claim. So steps. We're now uh, having about another 20 more minutes to go and I thought I might I can cover quite a few more things as well. But I might just cover some of the steps. We're just getting towards a little bit of a wrap up because I am interested in answering questions that people have out there, um, but whether through this seminar, a webinar, or externally. Uh, and the steps what should strata managers, owners, corporations, and owners do now? And I say it's clear the person that managed control of the scheme must take actions to minimise or eliminate those COVID 19 hazards. As I said, those hazards are no different to trip, slip, electrical, fall hazards, and the like. Uh, just because it's uh, health related doesn't mean it's, it's not a hazard and doesn't mean that you don't have a, a, other obligations. Now, we find a lot of people don't want to accept the personal responsibility of putting together a plan or doing all the research and spending hours reading and trying to guess what the government wants. And that's why they simply engage us and follow our, our plan. You engage a professional because you're protected by professional indemnity insurance. But more importantly, as I said in the beginning, you have to implement. That's why we have it's action plans. So you implement control measures. It's no good just reading the, the things. You've got to put things in place. Um, and the Europe periodic review it. Um, in the last week, there's been five changes to our health orders. On Saturday morning, for example, I had a look on a legislation website. Yep, that all looks pretty good. And later that, uh, that afternoon or that night, oh, they've had a new category, safety. What's all this about? So I had a look on that and see whether does that plug in now. So that was a change came in on Saturday, starting on Sunday, and I expect other changes will come through. So I try and keep up to date with those things. 
that's probably a key area to have a look at. And then unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever it is, that, that health order then refers us to the website. And you've got to go and look at the website, and try and understand and interpret that. What's, what's an authorised worker? There's 13 odd categories there. There's um, certain things to go. And I'll mirror the points made by uh, state government. Uh, that's through Matt Press and, and um, Chris talking. Is the work essential? If it's not essential, then you shouldn't be doing it. If it can be put off for some other time, put it off for some other time. But the essential work are things like fire safety, safety in general, uh, the nature there of critical financial services. So things like you know, having to get insurance or, or um, particular reports carried out, they're essential and they get over the line. So what I might do, Vicky, is if you've got some questions there that you like, um, happy, happy to answer some of those. Well, I'll, I'll go through some of my notes and have a bit of a talk um, on some of these other bits. Excellent, thank you so much. Well, that was really fantastic. Some great practical information there, which I'm sure people will find very, very useful. Um, as you said, we've, we've also received lots of questions about confusion out there. So that makes some things nice and clear. Um, thank you to the people who did submit um, questions to us. We'll go through those um, submitted questions first. And then after that, we'll try and catch up on some of the comments that have come through while we've been chatting, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Um, okay, great. So we'll start with the first one. This one came in from David from New South Wales. We've had to postpone window restoration works for our strata scheme of seven apartments until after lockdown. The repairs to windows will, in, will occur inside each apartment and two tradespeople will be in each apartment for a sustained period of time, sort of one to two days each. When we commence this work, is the company involved required to show us vaccination certificates for each tradesperson? Should we develop a policy for our scheme beyond lockdown for all tradespeople engaged to work on site internally, both in individual lots or in common areas? And is such a policy reasonable? Would it also be necessary that the policy extends to visitors to individual apartments as well? Do residents have to show their vaccination certificates to the trade company in a reciprocal manner, which I thought was an interesting question. And can the recommended, can you recommend the way forward post lockdown, which will ensure that visitors and tradespeople minimize the spread of strains of coronavirus? Oh, that's good. That's a couple of questions in there. The answer for you laying in relation to the, uh, the view on vaccination and lays in Safe Work Australia. And their view is that there's no need to provide vaccination certificates for work and the like. Um, even though I'm not an expert in, in um, the health side of things, I, I look at YouTube and I, and I do quite a bit of research. As we're aware, when you get vaccinated, it looks after your blood, but not necessarily your mucuses. You can still be vaccinated, but still pass on the, the virus. So being vaccinated, it's not a complete safety to a great degree. The individual workers have an obligation, their safe work method statement is to have appropriate practices in place. That's cleaning barriers, uh, not causing harm to other people. That's why I took you through the work health and safety journey. Um, but the owners themselves, the owners corporation have a responsibility as well for not passing things on. If you are in isolation or um, um, you're in quarantine, which restricts movement and you have a bubble, then you shouldn't be letting anyone into that bubble. So you have an obligation to people outside. I noticed Real Estate Institute had a very good questionnaire for those um, inspections where prospective purchasers can turn up. They've got to fill a questionnaire in. Have you been in a COVID-19 environment and a whole number of questions. So that's the diligence on the agent side. Um, guidance forward, yeah, by the plan, follow the steps. Um, as I said, the whole world's changed and we've got to change our because the environment's changed, we've got to change our, our uh, systems and our mannerisms and our way we op operate. And that's tested up against your civil liability obligations. So uh, I think I pretty well covered that. Nikki, I, have a, I do have a full answer for that further. <laughs> No, that's great. And we will be publishing these over the next few weeks or so as well. Well, so thank you very much. You've sent through some really detailed um, responses, which we can put up on the website as part of our Q&As. Um, so the next one we'll move on to. Um, Under the current rules, should indoor strata pools and gyms in Sydney be closed? Who is responsible for determining if common areas such as indoor pools and gyms are to be closed? Our strata manager says this is determined by the strata committee and not the building manager. 
Yeah, that's correct. If you look at the uh, strata schemes management legislation, the strata committee in essence runs the show and makes the decisions and people like building uh, managers and the like operate on behalf of the committee's directions and which might be the direction of the strata manager then to the building manager. Ultimately, it's a strata committee and above the strata committee is obviously everyone. The owners corporation can vote and shift them out and replace them and the like. Um, if you look at the intent of legislation, it's the avoiding the interaction with people in the public. So when you look at things of gyms and pools, it tends to be the public interaction. I mentioned before about bubbles. So if you think about bubbles being safe, how do we keep our bubbles safe? And if there's appropriate measures in place, then the strata committee may decide to um, leave those facilities open, providing those measures are, are in place. Okay, thank you. Uh, what can be done when certain residents refuse to wear a mask in common areas? Good way to answer that is um, out the front, there's some hoons driving up and down at, at speed. It's not up to me to enforce the law. Um, if you have bylaws in place, then you have that opportunity to, to uh, do that, or ultimately it's the police. As you've seen on, on the news over the last few weeks, police turning up to people's private residence. They've got illegal gatherings and things not occurring correctly and they'll just issue the fines and once people get a few of those five thousand dollar fines they might think maybe i should be putting my mask on or not as i've um, speaking to one person he said oh this other guy's excuse was that he held his breath from the front door till he got to his unit well it doesn't say that in the health order anyway holding breath it just says wear a mask <laughs> sort of thing uh, and it's it's the police issue so bring the police and let them sort it out okay thank you good advice um, what is the protocol when a resident has a party in their apartment during lockdown? Same deal again, police. It's not for you to go up and knock on their door and, and, and try to impose what you think uh, is the law or not the law and, and what your interpretation is. It's, uh, that's why we have police. Okay, this one's from ACT. In the ACT, a number of strata lots have diplomatic families living in them. In our situation, the complex comprises predominantly retired over 50 to 60 year olds up to a 94 year old. The complex also has a number of diplomat families who rent properties. The federal government allows diplomats to quarantine at home on arrival in Australia and not have to quarantine in de designated hotels at the first port, port of entry. If they arrive in Sydney, they can travel by car and presumably without a rest break en route. We can live with that situation as it happens worldwide. But the issue we discovered was, what do those people do with their household rubbish and how should it be disposed of over the 14 days or longer if they test positive to COVID? There appears to be a lot of general COVID safe information, but not a lot of information and tips from authorities who have properly thought through what happens out there in strata land. Strata land, what's strata land? Some government, <laughs> some public servants might, might ask. Um, and I might add to the, Things I've written up through my sources, in particular, having action points in, I think that probably triggered that last uh, change dealing with uh, COVID plans and details, but still hasn't gone far enough. To answer the question there, um, there is some documentation saying that people who are in self-isolation um, or in quarantine, the waste is not contaminated waste. The waste is not special waste. It's just treated as normal waste. Uh, and my view is that you double bag it anyway. And the reason you double bag any of these things, so one of the steps we have in our plans is that if you do go into lockdown, double bag your rubbish and whatever time is set up, leave it outside the door, it'll be collected by a third party outside who's not self-isolating. And because it's getting handled more, it's the benefit of having the double bags there and then avoiding that interaction. Oh, that's a good point raised by one of my staff yesterday, picking a pizza up or having a pizza or something delivered. Yes, just get them and leave at the door. Leave one minute before you open up the door. Why have this interchange of air? And she said, oh, that's a good point. And when she raised it with her uh, nurse friend, she said, oh, oh yeah, you're 100% right. That's what we get trained. So why do you have this interaction? Okay, great. Leave the, leave the delivery there. Let the air change and that's it. And that is one of the principles too, is greater ventilation and um, uh, fresh air. Um, and I think the analogy from the research I've looked at, you can stand in a drenching rain or you can have a light mist. So it's a matter of the load you're trying to minimise. That's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got back to New South Wales. Um, our strata manager just asked the OC whether we want to install hand sanitizers. I'm curious if regulations are coming in that require this or whether it's just a precaution. 
that's a precaution. I haven't heard any regulations as such, but if they want to regulate, then they'd, they'd regulate that all owners corporations like Victoria must have a, a COVID safe plan in place. And they went a little bit soft on that. And I can explain a little bit about that in, in a little bit more detail. Um, but it, it, the question is, is the right thing to do? Will that keep your family safe? Will that keep you safe? Not, oh, is it a regulation? Oh, where, you show me what section and what act, and then I might think about it. Well, when you're, when you're ill, you're not feeling too well, you might think, well, maybe that decision back then is, you know, I should have put one in place. And that's the other thing we look at is, uh, in decision-making, we say, um, in three to five years' time, when we're having this, this chat, what would have been the right decision to make back then? And in this circumstance, you may be putting, pitching yourselves in weeks in front or a few months in front. And say, if we're looking around December and look back, oh, it would have been better back in August or September to put all these measures in place. And that's the important uh, question. I think we should, or one of the tools we use to answer our questions. Okay, now on that note, um, because you've said that, I was actually at um, at a, 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 a employment um, expo here in WA on the weekend and I was on the SCA stand just talking to people about getting into Strata. And one of the um, people that I, was on, that I was on the session with, Mitch from WA, asked me, because he knew we were having this session well, and I think you've spoken to Mitch from Richardson Strata a few times. <laughs> great, great so, yeah, yeah, that's it, he is, he's wonderful. Now he, uh, he just wanted me to ask you, Coming from WA in a state, uh, obviously, like we're in a situation at the moment where we don't have any community transmission over here, and so everything's opened up and everything's continuing as normal. What should the buildings in WA be doing at this stage right now um, to get ready just in case something happens? Should they have a plan in place? Should they be looking forward as to what, what might occur? And things just change so quickly, don't they, when they do change? Uh, they do. I, I don't believe they should be putting a plan in place as much as I'd like to sell a ton of plans in the Western Australia. And I, I might add too, we have over 34% of that um, individual strata managers in WA's clients. Um, I think they should just be aware of the things we have available. And if unfortunately they do have those breaches and it does rapidly get out of control, then we need to put those measures in place. But at this stage, I don't see um, any danger in, in WA and the necessity to put the level of the plans that we've produced for uh, the Eastern States, South Australia and um, Northern Territory and everyone else uh, in place in WA at this stage. So Great, you thank you. That's, that's really uh, good information. I argued against my own interest. <laughs> <laughs> you did, but it's great to, great to know. So very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure Mitch is hopefully listening or he'll listen to the recording if he's not on live at the moment. Uh, okay, so we'll go back to some other questions that were submitted during the session that we've had here today. Um, Nigel from New South Wales, I haven't read through these, so you might have to bear with me as I'm reading it. I, don't, I haven't proof, proofread them. Uh, I have comments, questions, uh, re-emergency or essential maintenance. I've, I have covered fire inspections and test here, but would also relate to emergency access for electrical, plumbing, etc. New South Wales Health and Fire Protection Association, Fire Protection is an essential service under Essential Services Act 1988, uh, fire protection workers are essential workers listed in item four, section public administration and safety, fourth dot point, fire protection and safety. As this is an essential service in New South Wales, how would you recommend handling of building access, especially outside of common areas um, in SOUs? If we can't get access to all units, what happens with the provision of the annual fire safety statement under the new requirements in New South Wales? If as a strata, we have site access requirements, um, proof of testing results and uh, that exceed the New South Wales health requirements, can we enforce these? Who pays for the time for this additional testing? Should we have copies of the contracts COVID safe management plan and who reviews the plan? So sorry, there's a lot there. Thanks, Nigel. No, that's good, Nigel. Um, there's a couple of ways to answer that. Firstly, authorised uh, workers. There's a list, as I said, about 13 or 14 or so categories. Services is one of those. Fire safety is stands alone by itself. Fire safety and infrastructure, I think it is. It's already been, um, in a way, decided or put out there. Fire safety are fine. And that's a great job that Paul Waterhouse from the Fire Protection Association Australia has put together. And uh, the guys there from 2020 fire. Um, so that's fine to go. The issue though you have is going and forcing into people's places in a COVID situation. If people are uncomfortable letting you in for whatever reason, well, you can't force your way in. And then you have a problem there. So I can't complete my annual fire safety statement because I haven't tested the, the um, smoke alarms and the like, then 
there's a bit of a disconnect in that regard. I have written a draft up for a particular other organisation that does inspections. And in that um, safety uh, brief, there's things like, okay, talking to the person, sending them a little um, snapshot of questions to answer, and they answer back. There's no COVID issue that I have. I don't have a sniffly, no sniffly nose and all those things. So it's safe to go in, I'm ready to do that inspection. Doors and windows left open, they go and hide in one of the bedrooms, the inspection's carried out, the, the uh, inspection's completed, sanitised before you go back into the car, have that sort of safe process. There's no one that I'm aware of is reviewing your individual tradesperson's um, COVID-19 plans. It's a matter for yourselves and trying to work out your own risks. A bit similar to your safe work method statements, you put them together at your peril, and if you get prosecuted, then you've got to be able to uh, say that you've put the reasonable measures in place and satisfied the, uh, the requirements of work, health and safety legislation. So that's relating to tradespeople. I think I've covered all those points, oh, other than councils. <laughs> Some councils are giving a, a delay in getting AFSSs back and say, well, due to COVID, we don't mind if it's delayed. I don't think the legislation gives them that, that latitude, but it's a practical uh, circumstance. Okay, thank you so much. Well, that was some, um, yeah, very <laughs> lots of information to cover there. So thank you. Um, okay, in Victoria, uh, waste removal is essential. Is vacuuming floors essential? It's unclear in Victoria at the moment. Uh, the, the guidance we've got from a New South Wales state government um, is vacuuming essential? The answer is no. Is cleaning and disinfecting that there's two parts that people think are oh, it's a clean thing. No, you, you clean surfaces and then you disinfect those surfaces. So it's a two stage thing. And in that bucket dealing with, um, um, with our key cleaning guy in New South Wales with the state government came out from that vacuum is not essential. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm just reading other ones. Another one from Victoria, um, chairperson six level building Victoria without a cleaner daily is the best option to put a white machine in the lift. Building manager attends daily, but isn't there isn't enough cleaning. Yeah, I think the key issue on that is uh, minimise transmission. Um, and if it means putting four or five or 10 sanitising elements around the place, then just go and do that. Um, I know this sounds a little bit tangential to a degree, but you know, squirk a bottle of methylated spirits is probably a couple of dollars. And if you have two of those new, some handle that people have to touch or your sanitizer, why wouldn't you have those there? Why two? Oh, because you pick up one, you might have contamination on your fingers. You spray things there and the other bottle you pick up and spray that bottle so in a way that might be rather than wasting your sanitizer that might be a cheaper option for people who are thinking it's, it's too high a hurdle well hey, it's only methylated spirits it's got um, um, alcohol in it and yes sanitizer we're looking for 70 percent or greater and that's it um, the other practical tools you're talking about doors and touch surfaces one of the things i've put in here is considering putting hands-free door openers it's not this whiz bang expensive exercise, it's just a bent bit of metal, a bit like the coat hanger you have on the back of the toilet door. And if you have it three quarters of the way out from your hinge, you put your foot down on it, you open the door, and then you, with your foot, you open the door. Why do I want to touch that handle? How do I avoid touch that handle? So there might be other practical measures they can put in place, but certainly more sanitizers around the place is better. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just copying down a few more questions as we go. We do it. We've had a few good ones come in. So uh, I think this was uh, New South Wales again from memory from from Jenny. Uh, should delivery people who drop off articles, food, etc., use our Strata QR codes even if they're only in the foyer for a minute? The answer is yes. We we want all connections throughout. And if that one delivery guy was um, uh, was deemed to be positive how would anyone know he was there and what if he doesn't tell anyone so that's why we rely on the government qr code system and their contract traces contact traces will come straight out do their interviews and make a determination who is a close contact and who is other categories of contacts and what appropriate measures are in place as i said in the hierarchy and the evolution i see with the third stage which is quick reaction and we want to capture everyone okay thank you uh, we've got one from Josephine about, I'm just going back to the original question, um, AS1851, this is for New South Wales, requires sprinkler heads to be inspected yearly um, at our 80 unit building in North Sydney. This has not been done for 19 years. I cannot find a way to get this done. 
Um, so it's, this is more of a broader question, I think not specifically dealing with what's happening at the moment with COVID-19. Yeah, I understand. Um, 1851 primarily deals with the maintenance of fire um, elements, the fire protection elements. Uh, the answer for you would lay in the environment protection, sorry, environment, environment planning regulations. I'm just trying to think of the numbers. I, I gave a presentation, actually it's in my risk management module that uh, all strata managers did last year. So there is requirements in there and there might be even penalties in there. So there's legislation of having that um, met. She can okay, write to me, I can, I, can, I can find that the, the element and give her a little bit more detailed um, answer. Okay, that's great. Well, Josephine, if you'd like to send that through to me um, on, or just reply back to the invite that you got for the webinar, and then we can pass it on to, to Wall and get some more information through to you. Um, and um, we might just do one more. I've tried to copy down the questions that have come in, I think, which is um, as best to my ability, but we'll just jump to one more and then we might just wrap it up because we have gone over the, the, um, the time limit here. Um, <laughs> So this one I think is um, is quite a good one. Um, how to best manage home removals. If a resident is moving out, sh um, should a time slot be allocated to the removalist so as not to overlap unnecessarily with comings and goings of the residents? Rostering. Remember I mentioned about bubbles as one of the takeaway points. How do I keep my bubble safe? And with with staff, for example, I think when you're, you know, you meet on a Monday, so is our bubble safe? Oh yeah, we you know one part person says oh we stayed home and we didn't go. What about you? Oh, normal shopping, but we're pretty safe. So therefore the work bubble's safe as well as your social bubble. So you might say we're doing a removalist from this time to this time. Please not use the lift or whatever at that particular point in time. And you got post cleaning and methylated spirits or whatever other cleaners they the, the cleaners use. And I think part of that regime of moving, you might want to consider putting in a cleaning regime after. You want to use the lifts for that period of moving your furniture in and out. Why wouldn't you say as part of that condition of using the lifts for that time frame, you've got to have a cleaner in there to come and clean at 11 o'clock and or you know, five to 11. And once that's completed, the lifts are then free from 11 onwards. Um, I've given quite a bit of information. I do have one request, Nikki. I just thought of it then. I'm building the contingency plan that I have and I'm still trying to get hold of people in health. So if any Australian members out there, and I've, I've spoken to a couple already that have had lockdowns, I'm looking at building what elements and other things should be putting in the contingency plan so that's robust for everyone. So please feel free to contact me if you've had some of those experience. And one of the um, strata managers that did have a hit, I said, here's my, here's my um, um, COVID-19 safety action plan. Would have this been assistance to you when you had that lockdown? She said, absolutely. Is it health or most treaters like, you know, should have known what to have done and, we have no idea. So we did the best we can and still getting criticised to a degree. Oh, that's great. Be good if I can get hold of the right people. So I think the journeys, the lessons we, we learn and the hub of information I get, and I pass that to SEA New South Wales and SEAs around um, the states. I've spoken to um, Shelley in uh, ACT the other night. Um, and I spoke to um, Gregor, I think yesterday, or maybe the day before. Okay. So I am in contact with them and assisting as best I can with, with these things. So the better I, I'm armed, the better I can assist our community through SEA doing a phenomenal job. Excellent. If you'd like to get a, a quick blurb to me, I can pop that at the top of the newsletter for tomorrow morning and just put a call, call out to say if anyone can get back in touch with you, I'm very happy to do that, um, if it will help everybody out there. And then we've just, um, just someone, oh, thank you. Sorry, I should have just done that. So the, the, uh, the plan. That's how easy it is to fill in. So for this social distancing, it'll have an element and it applies to your scheme. And once, if it does, great. But in particular, it doesn't, but it does. If it does, then you pick it once it's done. It's that simple. It's not okay, right. wonderful. Yeah, cool. that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for showing everybody that. Okay, and we just had one request. Um, you mentioned you talk about employees of Strata. Our, co our contract is different and so yes. still exempt from requirements. Yes, they are. They are. Okay. If you look, look at the category, I think it's uh, Section 7 of the Act. It defines a worker and there's about 12 different definitions and it's very particular because it's engage um, a worker as an employee not engage a worker as a contractor it's very specific it's only when you employ someone that that you lose that exemption if you employ, engage a worker as a contractor so what it's you know it's the contractor's area they're still in work health and safety not no obligation on you as the body corporate unless there's 
non-residential in that particular area. Okay, and we've had a comment come in from Michelle and thank you so much, Michelle. She's saying, I had a friend who was in the building in, in Melbourne in lockdown and she'll try and find who the manager was and get that information through to us. So thank you so much for that. Anyone else who has any information out there, if they can, um, yeah, just let us know. That would be fantastic. Um, okay, now I think we should, um, yeah, we could talk for hours, couldn't we? Well, but I think <laughs> we've sort of gone over now. So, okay, we'll just wrap it up. Um, so if you have submitted a question and we ran out of time before we addressed it, I think I think I've copied most of them down, but please feel free to jump onto the Look Up Strata site and go to the, the Ask, Ask a Strata question page and then submit that and then that make sure that we won't miss it. And we'll certainly try and get back to you with the response um, when we can. Uh, at the end of the session, we always like to ask our guests if they've got some information to share with us or something exciting that's happening. So, well, if, you, if you've got something you'd like to tell us about, that would be great. Something to do with the industry or... Oh, I've just got to say, um, in relation to our Australian industry, uh, leading leading in relation to um, the people who have our, in, in our say, SEA leadership and becoming a profession um, and recognised profession, a phenomenal job and something that'll benefit not only um, uh, our strata managers and our strata community, but I think our broader community overall. Great job they've put in place and something that everyone should be proud of, um, not just strata managers, but also owners as well. And there's a very, very good and very clear path and very good work that's been done behind the scenes. So those guys in our leadership areas of strata should be applauded for the work they've been putting. And that's in all states, not just New South Wales, every state from you know, WA, Catherine doing a great job over there and Shelley and um, terrific. I'm Josh, I've got to have a talk to him today. Hopefully I'll get through to him. Um, so that's great. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, I totally agree. Um, yeah, we're 100% supportive of SCA and what they're doing across the nation. And um, yeah, really great to see. And if there are any any lot owners out there that that um, are like administration and they're really interested in the, the type of work that's, um, that's done, it's a great industry to get involved in. So certainly uh, contact even your strata manager and have a talk to them about how you can get involved in the industry. It's fantastic. All right, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody for joining us. It's um, it's lovely to see so much support here. We had we actually had record numbers today, Well, so thank you very much. <laughs> you, you've, you've, you've topped out our numbers. I think we had sort of over 300 people register for the event and um, we had almost 200 people jump in there today, which was fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, we'll get the session out to you later on today and get back to you with any other um, responses as we can. So thanks thanks so much, well, for your time. Uh, pleasure, Nikki. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks, everyone, for your questions. And please feel free to contact me. I'm happy to help out. We've got plenty of information to assist and fill in that bottom, bottom run of information that people are saying, well, what am I supposed to do? And we've got the answer for you. Definitely. So get in touch with Wall. Um, it looks like a great resource and I'm sure it will help um, clear the waters for, for the buildings out there. So wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. Bye-bye.